What's the word, y'all? I know I'm speaking for everybody when I say I cannot wait for the NBA season to start. So much so I'm looking forward to the preseason. Nobody cares about preseason. I'm looking forward to that. It kind of happens the same way every year for me. We hit the offseason, and I'm like, man, I can't wait for the summer league. And then I watch one day of summer league, and I'm like, ah, I'll see y'all when the preseason come around. Then the preseason come around, I watch one day of preseason, I'm like, ah, it don't really count, so let's wait to the regular season. I just need to see basketball. <laughs> I need to see NBA-level basketball. And I guess the preseason around the corner, October 5th, the Bulls go against the, who was it, the Cavaliers, and I'm trying to be in the tennis as a day after my birthday, my birthday gift, so maybe I'll be there, maybe I won't. But it got me thinking about players that have a lot of proof. It's basically just a, a avenue for me to talk about some players that's been on my mind. Take it with a grain of salt. Like one of these players, the first player we're going to talk about is a player that has cemented himself as a Hall of Famer. He's one of the greatest point guards of all time. He doesn't have anything to prove, but I just want to talk about Russell Westbrook. Whenever I talk to an older player in the NBA, um, I ask them the question about legacy because I'm very curious to how people view the word legacy or their own personal legacy. And a lot of the old NBA players give me a similar response when they say, I really don't care. I feel like Russell Westbrook feels the same way. He does not care about his legacy. He knows where he stands. He is a Hall of Famer. He has won an MVP award, all of those things. But he's never won that championship. And this is the probably the best shot he's going to get since the KD days when they were actually in the finals. And when I say Russell Westbrook has a lot to prove, you know, you see I keep doing this because it, it's just, again, it's just an avenue for me to talk. Um... This year is going to be any different than any year of Russell Westbrook's career. Think about OKC, when they started off, he was second fiddle to Kevin Durant. Then Kevin Durant goes to the Golden State Warriors, and now Russell Westbrook has his own team. He leads them to the playoffs on a crazy... Do you remember the Russell Westbrook MVP season? The race between him and James Harden? Oh my god. Anyway, he wins MVP. All of that washes up, he ends up in his next destination. And now he's been the, the guy for his team for, what, two years now? Three years since uh, Kevin Durant has left. And now he goes to Houston, and now I'm back to second fiddle for the first time in a couple years. It didn't really work out. Then he ends up in Washington, he's second fiddle to Bradley Beal. Didn't really work out. And now with the Lakers, he's the third guy. Now, on a lot of nights, he will be the one guy. He will be the two guy. But when it matters the most, and I'm talking playoff action, Russell Westbrook will probably be the third guy. And we haven't seen that. Now, in the regular season, you know LeBron is going to coast his way because he's 37 years old. He don't need to play 80-something games at a higher intensity. And that's one of the reasons why you trade for Russell Westbrook. Anthony Davis can be wishy-washy. As much as I hate to say it, the man be injured every other game. So you're going to get a lot of Russell Westbrook being the guy type nights. But when we come to the playoffs, and hopefully they're healthy with a healthy AD and a healthy LeBron James, Russell Westbrook is going to have to play a role where he hasn't played before. Now, Russell Westbrook is a ball-dominant player. That's not a knock, but it's just the way he is. But even with that being said, he has played very well as second fiddle. You got to think about it. Kevin Durant led the league in scoring and won an MVP with Russell Westbrook on the side. He goes to Houston. James Harden practically averages 35 points per game. Then he ends up at Washington and Bradley Beal leads the league in scoring too. So even though Russell Westbrook is a ball dominant player, he still finds a way to let whatever the star of the team is be him, be them. And now it's just a little bit different with them being the third, he him being the third. This is his best chance to win an NBA uh, championship since, again, the OKC year where they were in there. And at that age, I think he was like 22 years old, and now he's older and mature. I, I don't have much doubt in my mind that Russell Westbrook will be able to adapt to certain situations. But I need uh, Coach Frank Vogel to really step up his coaching. I saying something, you know, telling a championship coach to step it up. But one of the things that I believe that Russell Westbrook needs to do to be highly effective, especially in the playoffs, is be active off the ball. Russell Westbrook has been an off the ball player in very, very, on a very, very long time. He kind of like, you got to think about what the system was in Houston. It was like, watch James Harden work, and I'm going to be in a dunker spot sometimes because I'm a 6'4 center because we traded Clint Capella away, or Bradley Beal going to work, and I'm kind of going to sit here. I believe that Russell Westbrook has the potential to be one of the greatest cutters in the NBA if Frank Vogel made him do that more often. So this is a year where he has something to prove because it's just different. And a lot of people see them as the shoe in to win the Western Conference. And you can't win the Western Conference if Russell Westbrook doesn't end up being the Russell Westbrook you need him to be. Today's video is inspired by a CBS Sports article that I saw that I didn't really agree with, so that's why I'm doing my own little list. Um, these are off the top of the dome, by the way. Or not really off the top of the dome, but some, some names that came to mind immediately. Number two, again is a player that has been an all-star, but now his circumstances are different than any time in his career, and that is Zach Levine. He is my star player here in Chicago, and I've never been a person that has subscribed to the empty stats 
narrative around any player, whether it be Devin Booker, whether it be Zach Levine, whether it be Carl Anthony Towns, any of that. I've never really believed that. I just believe that some players are in a situation that doesn't work well. I mean, I just think about it like this. If you can hoop, you can hoop. Zach Levine can hoop. It just so happened that there's never been a team that he's been on that has been good enough to make the playoffs. He's never had the situation to showcase to the world that he's more than an empty stats guy, and this is the year. I have no doubt in my mind that he's going to change that narrative around, but I, I know some people out there that still see Zach Levine in that way. The same way they saw Devin Booker in that way last year, then he went to the bubble, went 8-0, hey, no, and helped the team, led a team, second fiddle, whatever you want to call it, to a team that went to the NBA Finals. Ain't nobody ever going to say the word empty stats and Devin Booker in the same sentence anymore. And what changed? Yes, Devin Booker has got better, but what changed was the people around him. His front office built a team that was competent. And guess what? He's starting to win games. But whoa, who would have thought that his teammates being good means that he's going to win more games? And Zach Levine is in a similar opportunity right now with having the best roster he has ever been on. Ever been on. Now, what I would like from Zach Levine this season, I don't need him to average 25, 26, 27 points per game. I don't. If he keeps that same amount of efficiency, I'm happy. If the team is winning more games, I'm happy. I want to see Zach Levine beat some people back door. Zach Levine had been holding the ball more than anybody because nobody else on the team. We had no point guards that you trust. We had no playmakers. Now we have multiple. So now the, the usage rate of Zach Levine should go down and that will allow him to work off the ball, which I think he can be one of the best in the entire league at. Next player on my list is Pascal Siakam. I know he probably won't be there for the, the season opener because he had some shoulder surgery, but the narrative around Pascal Siakam has dramatically changed in just one year's time. Um, he went from a guy to most improved player, all-star, all-NBA type player to a guy that people laughed at and he was the butt of a lot of jokes. And I, I would be lying to you if I didn't make jokes too, like told you I didn't make jokes too. I definitely have you know what i'm saying it's part of the thing i mean listen you know how extremely unlucky that man pascal was this season do you know how many shots rimmed out and it just so happened he he was spinning to shoot the shot so yeah I'm, i've made some jokes but i've never been off spicy p island I, I still have the shirt from three years ago you know what i'm saying and this year, when he becomes healthy and his shoulder is okay, this is his opportunity to change the narrative around again. I don't know if he's going to be an All-NBA player. I actually doubt he'd be an All-NBA player again, but it's possible. Um, but I, I think that a lot of people are turned off by the way last year happened for Pascal Siakam. There are a lot of variables that, that you can attribute to him playing as bad as he did. If you really think about it, he didn't have a terrible season. He just wasn't as good as he was two years ago. So you, people were just comparing him to himself and he didn't live up to that expectation. This is a year where the expectation is like, eh. So he got nothing to do but to jump up. And the last guy on my list feels weird to be here, but this is a guy I want to talk about. Um, Jaron Jackson Jr., um, this offseason for the Memphis Grizzlies was definitely an interesting one. They made a lot of different moves. And I think on paper, a lot of people will agree that their team might be worse this year than it was last year. I'm not going to underestimate them because I've done that two years in a row. I didn't think that their rosters were good enough to make playoff pushes, and they did every year. So I'm not saying that it's impossible for them. But they made changes to say that, hey, Jaron, we need you to play more than 11 games. We traded away Jonas Valanciunas, who some people might argue was the best, most impactful player on our team other than John Morant. It is your time to shine. Here are the keys. Go drive. And if he can't stay healthy, and I know a lot of that is not due to himself. He can't control what type of injuries he comes down with. Um, he needs to be good at the at the minimum. He has to be good for them to continue this. We're going to be good enough to compete every single night. We're going to be good enough to maybe get in a play-in and potentially still a playoff spot and then still a playoff game. He needs to be that second option for John Morant. And he hasn't been that for an entirety of his career just yet because he cannot stay healthy. There's no Jonas Valanciunas there no more. You got Steven Adams, who's still an okay NBA player, but it's like you, Jaron. It's you, it's Desmond, it's Dylan, it's Kyle, but a lot of it is you this year. So like I said, CBS Sports put together an article and that was the inspiration behind this. Let me find this article because I, I thought a lot of the stuff they said in this article was just like, eh. I actually hate C, uh, CBS, by the way, um, because they do this thing where they play a video once you go to their page. Don't do that. If you're a web designer, don't do this. This is the worst that you could possibly do. Because I, I don't even want to be here right now because this started playing. I legit want to cut this part of the video out, but I already told you that I was going to show you. So Ben Simmons, among 10 players, this feels like beating a dead horse. That's why I didn't say the name Ben Simmons in this video. Obviously, that makes sense. Whatever. Ben Simmons, number one. Dennis Schroeder, 
I, I guess so. He just said on, on Instagram he ain't worried about that 84 million that he turned down. So shout out to him. Victor Oladipo, sure. Now, what you're going to see is that there are a lot of players coming off injuries. Well, yes, if you're going to come off an injury, yes, you have a lot to prove, but it feels like a cop-out answer. Yes, Victor Oladipo has a lot to prove. Porzingis is a really good uh, name, but I knew it was going to be on this list, so I didn't say it. Spencer Dinwiddie, he's coming off an injury. He's got a lot to prove. Andre Drummond. I, I mean, sure, I just don't see Andre Drummond as a player that's going to get, be getting big money ever again just because his style of player is kind of aged out of the league. Markel Fultz coming off an injury. Kay Cunningham. Kay Cunningham. Oh, they're like, was he worth the tank? Okay, um, so sure, Robert Williams got an extension. Klay Thompson coming off an injury. That was their list. But like I said, I just want to talk about four NBA players, and I did exactly that. Let me know in, in the description or in the comment section who you believe has the most to prove, and I'll be down there reading your comments.